Content warning. This video deals with themes of suicide. Voyagers tracking a wobbly comet, whose wobbly can't be accounted for by conventional science. Never want to avoid poking a mystery, Janeway asks Balana to teleport a bit of it aboard to see what's making it do those wobbles. After sticking a force field around the teleporter pad, we grab a chunk, only to discover it's a lad in a Starfleet uniform. Except it's not, because he walks through the force field and introduces himself as Q. At this point, I should probably mention that whilst most memories of Voyager have been utterly expunged from my brain in the quarter of a century since they originally aired, the ending of this episode came back to me as soon as I saw the guy's face, so this isn't going to be quite the epic voyage of discovery that most of these videos are. That said, there's a lot of meat worth rechewing in this one, so let's get to it. Balana tells Janeway that their guest is called Q, and Janeway immediately puts the ship on red alert, which is a nice little touch. After saying she's on her way, Q tells her not to bother, and magics himself and her to the mess hall. She introduces herself, but he already knows, and just waves it off before thanking her for releasing him. He walks around the room, observing the crew with wonder, and calling them mortals, which is quite a well-executed way of explaining to anybody unfamiliar with the Q that they are something quite, quite different. He takes a particular interest in Kez, marvelling at her short lifespan, and saying he envies her. You see, what he wants, more than anything, is to die. Janeway interrupts and tells him that his exploits on the Enterprise are well known among Starfleet captains who've been warned about his bullshit. He begins to explain that wasn't him, but gives up as he realises he needs to get a move on if he's going to go through with this before the other Q stop him. To that end, he gives a short speech, saying they should tell the other Q that he died for them, then waves his magic fingers. He's a touch out of practice as, instead of dying, he makes all the men on the ship disappear. Unable to return them, he teleports himself and Janeway to the bridge, apologises again for the inconvenience, and makes to leave. Janeway's not having that bollocks, though, and demands their return. This Q doesn't seem very familiar with humans, though, which ignores the other species of male on the ship, but let's ignore that, and ponders which Q might have more experience with them. Which is, of course, when the Q we more commonly know turns up and asks what the new Q has done now. Before we go any further, and this gets needlessly confusing, we'd better clarify which Q is which, so I'm calling John DeLancey Pool Q and Garrett Graham Snooker Q. Asking how Snooker Q got out, Janeway admits she is the cause. Pool Q responds with casual misogyny, causing Janeway to conclude that he's the Q responsible for all the bullshit on the Enterprise. Noting that Voyager seems to have a distinct lack of men on board, Snooker Q confesses to there having been a bit of a fucky on his part, and Paul Q returns them after guessing Snooker Q was trying to kill himself. Paul Q wants to leave and take Snooker Q with him. Snooker Q has different plans, though, and petitions Janeway for asylum and protection from his enemies. Paul Q thinks this laughable and tries to take him, but Snooker Q gets his magic fingers in first and transports Voyager to a hiding place of his. Paul Q finds him, and some hide-and-seek ensues, until Janeway's had enough of their bollocks, calls them a pair of fucking children, and says she'll settle this with an asylum hearing. Each Q sets a condition. If Paul Q wins, Snooker Q is imprisoned forever. If Snooker Q wins, Paul Q must make him mortal so he can die. At this point, anybody watching this who's of the unshakable belief that Old Trek was never political or dealt with societal issues might want to switch off, because we're poking at the right of a sentient being to choose when they die. I'll add it to the list of episodes that some viewers think were just about aliens with pew-pew lasers. Snooker Q visits Tuvok, which is to say that he just pops in beside him. This act prompts Tuvok to ask if the Q have always been so rude, raising a rather interesting question on how civility can be influenced by a relative power imbalance. Snooker Q suggests civility is one of the things the Q continuum have lost, with another being a sense of purpose. We're nodding towards more interesting potential discussions here on how all power comes at a cost. No time for that, though, as Snooker Q is here to make a request. He wants Tuvok to be his representative in the hearing. Tuvok has no formal legal training, but he is familiar with the asylum process, and, perhaps more importantly to Snooker Q, Vulcan culture has embraced suicide under certain circumstances. The hearing begins after Janeway tells Pool Q to knock that Madame Captain shit off, to his chagrin. 
Snooker Q explains that his immortality consists of a choice between service to the Q Continuum, an obligation that he neither requested nor agreed to, or an eternity of incarceration. Pool Q begins his rebuttal in the most Pool Q way possible, by calling himself to the stand. After a round of masturbatory self-compliments, Pool Q explains that the death of Snooker Q could have unpredictable consequences for their entire collective. Snooker Q seizes on this to argue that the Continuum's motives are selfish, and driven by the fear of change to the whole, no matter the cost to each part of that whole. Pool Q continues by suggesting that, given immortality as a defining aspect of being Q, the desire to end that must be considered a sign of mental instability. Tuvok's turn, and he asks what other evidence there is to support the conclusion of mental instability. Pool Q offers the circular argument that sane people don't want to die, which Tuvok derails by arguing that many cultures view suicide as acceptable. Indeed, far from being able to offer further proof of mental instability, Pool Q is forced to admit that Snooker Q was considered a great philosopher prior to his wish to end his existence. In addition, Tuvok argues that other Q have been executed previously, making a nonsense of Pool Q's point that the death of a Q is an event to be avoided at all costs. Pool Q tries a different approach. He argues that Snooker Q's existence has influenced so much of the universe that his loss would be a loss to all. To that end, he summons three witnesses, some hippie schmuck called Maury Ginsberg, the founder of modern physics and a bit of a bastard, Isaac Newton, and the Enterprise D's serial shagger, William Riker. Snooker Q has affected them all in some way. Maury Ginsberg was given a lift by Snooker Q to his job as an engineer at Woodstock. He noticed an unplugged cable that, had it been missed, would have resulted in the cancellation of the entire festival. Additionally, his future wife and mother of his children was also in the car. Isaac Newton remembers him as the guy who was about to leave as he sat under a tree just before being hit by the apocryphal apple, the one that allegedly caused him to think about gravity. Indeed, Snooky Q jostled the tree a bit as he got up. Riker the Sex Pest doesn't remember him at all, but that's hardly surprising as they never met. One of his ancestors met him, though, during the American Civil War, and was saved by him, without which Riker would never have existed, and no Riker, Pool Q says, means the entire Federation would have been destroyed by the Borg. Pool Q is trying to suggest that allowing Snooky Q to die would mean that he was unable to engage in future activities like the ones he's just shown. Tuvok points out a problem with this argument, as the rest of his existence will be spent incarcerated with no outside contact, so that lack of influence will be the same regardless. While we're on the topic, Tuvok suggests we take a look at the conditions of that incarceration. Paul Q doesn't seem too fond of the idea, but Janeway tells him to shut the fuck up, and off we go. Suffice to say, it's a bit cramped and a touch cold. Whilst unpleasant, Janeway states that we're not here to judge the Q Continuum's penal system, she wants to be convinced that Snooker Q's continued existence would be a source of suffering that can only be alleviated by the end of that existence. She can see no physical reason why this is the case, and Tuvok requests a recess to consider their response. In the mess hall, Snooker Q believes they're going to lose, but thanks Tuvok for agreeing with him. One problem, Tuvok doesn't. He can't see the logic of someone with such power, such potential, choosing to end their life. Snooker Q thanks him for surprising him, as that happens so rarely to a Q, which is another nice little touch, and says he'd understand if he knew what that existence was like, which sounds rather like a plan. Before we get there, though, Janeway wants a third option, other than prison and death. She asks Pool Q to offer reintegration into the Q continuum for Snooker Q. The request is rejected, as Pool Q says Snooker Q is the most dangerous man in the continuum, but he does have a counter-proposal. Bribery. Rule his way, and you'll be sent home. We're back in the hearing, and Tuvok is proposing a little jaunt to the continuum. If we're to prove Snooker Q's existence qualifies as suffering, we need to examine that existence. The two Q's agree on how to make that happen, and we depart. The manifestation they agree on is a petrol station in the middle of the desert, scattered with euphemisms for Q existence. Snooker Q explains that this is his life. The road leads to the rest of the universe, but always back here. He's read the books. He's played the games. He was even the scarecrow, just to experience something different. And here we hit on the crux of Q existence, and the reason why Paul Q has a history of being such a massive asshole. 
Infinity is just so... fucking boring. Doing anything once can be exciting. Doing it forever? Everything to do has been done. Everything to see has been seen. Everything to say has been said. Everything to think has been... thunked? Infinity at a long time, and even the most sublime banquet, breeds contempt after the billionth mouthful. Too much of anything is bad for you, but too much of everything? Cosmic apathy. Forever and ever and ever. Snooker Q reveals that the actions of Pool Q, the bullshit that he got up to, were the first new and interesting things that had happened to the whole continuum for millennia. In fact, it was Pool Q's misdeeds that inspired Snooker Q to act. As an aside, the timeline for that doesn't make sense. We've already established in a previous scene that Snooker Q was imprisoned before the events of The Next Generation, but he references things that happened to Pool Q during those shows as part of his inspiration. Of course, all of this Q stuff is a bit fucky with regards to time, so we'll just put it down to that, I guess. As an additional aside, while John Delancey is always a delight in Trek, he shines here in his introspection. A shackled Q penitent for his crimes, but also regretful at not continuing them, his face lights up at discovering he was the cause of Snooker Q's rebellion. But again, I digress. We're shown the event that caused the Q to imprison Snooker Q, a magazine article in which he advocated for mortality. Pool Q says the confinement was for his safety, but Snooker Q argues it was not for his, but theirs. He then asks Janeway a question. As an explorer, would she choose to continue existing for eternity, once there was nothing left to explore? Their case is made, Janeway calls an end to proceedings and leaves to make her judgement. No sleep for her tonight, even before Pool Q appears in her bed. He asks whether she's considered his offer, which she refers to as a bribe, and he says he told the rest of the Q that Janeway wouldn't go for it. So he convinced them to not lock Snooker Q up again. After all, that was the original offer, right? Things have changed, though. She's seen that that would just be another present to him. Then he makes a pass at her, offering to take her home and show her a good time, which she declines. I suspect that this was meant to be both in keeping with the mercurial aspect of the established character and an indication that he's straining against the rules again, but it's still a bit creepy. In the morning, we receive Janeway's judgement. Whilst she understands the impact this may have on the continuum and does not make the decision lightly, she cannot, in good conscience, condemn someone to an eternity of suffering to maintain the status quo. Snooker Q is granted asylum and made mortal, but Janeway has a suggestion. Experience mortality. Just as flavours become bland from a million meals, so too may they change again with the knowledge that you're experiencing them for the last time. But it's not to be. As Chicote and Janeway are wondering what to do with Quinn, the name Snooker Q has given himself now he's mortal, they receive a call from the doctor. Quinn is dying. He's ingested a rare form of hemlock for which there is no antidote. Explaining to her that he would not truly have been able to fit in, Quinn thanks Janeway for the gift of freedom that she's given him, and dies. As Tuvok asks where he could have sourced the hemlock from, Pool Q arrives and admits it was him. He compliments Quinn on his bravery and rebelliousness, swearing to follow in his footsteps at fighting the status quo of the continuum, before telling Janeway that they'll meet again as we fly away. No explosions. No lasers. No aliens with slightly different forehead ridges. No last-second rescues. No science babble. No fancy flying. Remove all of the trappings, all of the decoration that too many writers think are the defining aspects of Trek, and you're left with this. As memorable an episode as you'll find in any of Trek's shows, and a perfect example of why those who casually dismiss Voyager are simply wrong. End of episode.